there are so many aspects of Cuban culture that are surprising. But perhaps the most surprising of them all can be found inside this former palace. Before the revolution, the lavish home of a sugar baron. Since the revolution, a factory of cigars, Cahiba, the very finest, each sold in London or Hong Kong for the equivalent of a monthly salary. Ever wondered what makes them so special? The leaves, yes. The rolling technique, of course. But according to one woman, there's another secret ingredient in a country with one of the highest literacy rates in the world. Muy buenos días. Literature on the loudspeaker. Saida is the official reader of this factory. The party newspaper in the morning, novels and poetry in the afternoon. Look, she told me, the psychologists have proven it. Hearing fine words improves the quality of the work here. Disagree with her if you must. But Cuba's extraordinary culture is also a glorious byproduct of a society that is still pitifully short on the distractions of choice and prosperity. And with so much to offer, it's not surprising that Cuba keeps attracting tourists, two million foreign tourists each year. So I asked uh, Suset Riestra from the Ministry of Tourism why tourism in this country was especially important for the economy. Well, uh, tourism is a part, uh, an important part of the Cuban economy, of course. We, uh, yearly, we receive, um, during the last years, more than two million uh, two visitors. Million. Yes. Right. And um, we have uh, many important markets, like uh, Canada was, is one of them, and of course European countries are part of the country. Uh, are part of the, the arrivals, right? Uh, the most important uh, countries coming to, to Cuba. Um, we can talk about, you know, uh, an average spending of um, $1,200 uh, dollars as an average, of course. Per tourist. Per tourist, uh, per visit. So, uh, well, you do the math. It's, yeah. it's important. So course. this is one of the most, perhaps the most important earner of foreign currency, of hard currency for Cuba? Yes, we could, we could say so, yes. Um, has there been any impact from the global recession on tourism here? Well, uh, actually, we are not immune to, to the global effects, of course. However, last year, uh, we, um, we had uh, an increase on uh, tourism. It was about uh, 3% uh, uh, compared to last, to the, to the year before. Oh, really? So, uh, however, of course, we, work, we keep on working on uh, standards of products and services and that diversification of products so that we can maintain those uh, results. I mean, you get a lot of European tourists here at the moment, yeah, and so, I've seen quite yeah. a few Asian tourists. What you really want are American tourists. Well, actually, we want um, tourists, you know. Uh, yeah, but they're just up the road. They're 90 miles from here in Florida. Anyway, uh, as a matter of fact, Europeans are more than 30% of uh, the total of arrivals to, to the country. And uh, the good thing about Europeans is that they like, you know, to enjoy our Mm, culture or history uh, they're really uh, like um, they enjoy being with people uh, our people and I think that's uh, really great for us and you think Americans wouldn't enjoy that I mean, Americans yes, love Cuban of, culture of course they would I'm sure they will so if, if uh, the trade embargo was lifted that would have a big impact a positive impact on tourism in this country well I, I guess so and do you see yourself, do you see Cuba in the future becoming one of the major tourist hubs of the Caribbean? Actually, uh, we, right now I think we're the third, um, in the isle and the isle of the island, yeah. the third um, a country receiving uh, tourists. Oh, really? So uh, I think we are in a position, of course, uh, for developing into, a, of course, a hub. we are in the center of the Caribbean, I think we, we can work uh, into that. Yeah, indeed. Suset Riesta from the Ministry of Tourism, thanks very much. You're welcome. Welcome back. As you've seen, throughout this week, Matt Fry has had the rare opportunity to report from inside Cuba. Before we end our special coverage from there, he joins us again with his final thoughts on what he's seen. Matt, last night we spoke about how the country has changed in the four years since you last visited. If you were to project forward for us, and I'm sure you will be back there again in four years at least, how do you th think the country might have changed then? Well, Katia, I think that all that depends on the political constellation that is very much a work in progress at the moment. 
if, and it is a huge if, there is genuine political change. In other words, if the government here has the courage to go to the next step, to really open up the market here a little bit more, to release some of those dissidents, uh, to make a unilateral step when it comes to internal reform and not just wait for the Americans to make the first step, not to be so obsessed with what America is doing with Cuba, then it is quite possible that you will see genuine change here because the raw material of this country, the people of Cuba, are extraordinary. There's one of the highest literacy rates in the world. There is at the workplace, when there can be a lot of discipline, there is a great willingness here to, to, to start enterprises, to work hard. Um, they've welcomed the outside community in the form of tourists where, you know, with extraordinary warmth. So there's an awful lot that can be done here. But the question is, does the government have the courage to allow these people who've been living in a nanny state, nanny McPhee, it has to be said, but a nanny state for the last 50 years, allow them to be treated like adults? And Matt, to what extent does Cuba's economy, the future of Cuba's economy, depend on America lifting the trade embargo? Or can it make economic progress without that? It is already doing that, Katty. I mean, uh, as you heard in Michael Voss's piece, America is actually the fifth largest trade partner with Cuba. There's a lot of American stuff that's sold here, especially food. Then you've got the Spaniards who are heavily involved. You've got the Canadians, you've got the Germans, you've got the Japanese. Uh, all the light bulbs here are Chinese, for instance. There's a lot of offshore drilling going on. Cuba has apparently, according to the local government, but also according to the International Geological Survey, pretty big oil reserves around its shores. Um, which are very deep and very difficult to, to access, but that is a potential for future wealth too. So there's a lot of potential stuff that can happen here. The question is, do you have the political framework in which the citizens of this country are prepared to take the risks in order to get to the next level, and the foreign businesses are prepared to accept the assurances of the government and also take their financial risks in order to pour money into this country? That is going to be the thing of the next four years and hopefully we'll be watching it closely. Cassie. Matt Fry reporting there from Havana, Cuba. Matt, thanks for your reporting this week. I hear you're tired. You look like you're having a great time. It was a policy with the stated aims of fostering free speech and spreading the freedom of information. But shortly after the US State Department announced it was easing internet sanctions against a few countries, Cuba fired back saying that the US was trying to destabilize the communist-run island. The charges come from a country with the lowest level of internet penetration in the Western Hemisphere. And as part of our continuing superpower series, we have this report from Michael Voss in Havana on the restrictions that the people of Cuba operate under. This is one of Havana's top high-tech high schools. These students do have access to computers and the internet. In class, they're learning to download and develop free software. The U.S. trade embargo means the school can't buy Microsoft Windows, Office or Photoshop. Free software is fine and you don't have to use cracked or pirated copies of the real thing, this 16-year-old told me, though many do. Cuba has one of the lowest internet usage rates in the Americas. People can now legally buy personal computers, but they're still not allowed an online connection at home. Rafael Hernandez edits a monthly magazine and does have internet in his office with more or less free access to the web. I have access to the Miami Herald. I have access to, of course, to Granma. To what can't you access? Any kind of uh, sex magazine like if it was a very subversive. Let, let's suppose that I say Playboy. You see? Yeah. Preferal deny. Hardline Cuban exile websites are also blocked. And it's difficult for bloggers like Ioani Sanchez to get their voices heard. Her critical blog, Generation Y, has won international acclaim. She writes them at home but uses internet centers at the international hotels to email them abroad. Cubans are free to go online at hotels, but at $8 an hour, that's more than the average weekly wage. 
The Cubans blame the restrictions on this island's limited access to the internet. Just a few miles offshore are the giant undersea fiber optic cables, which the Cubans were never allowed to plug into. So all internet from here is by satellite. With limited bandwidth, it's expensive and slow. Venezuela is constructing a fiber optic cable for Cuba, while President Obama has now lifted the ban on US internet providers servicing the island. Once Cuba is finally plugged in, the test then is whether the government will allow everyone to have unlimited access at home. Michael Voss, BBC News, Havana. The Olympic torch may have just been extinguished in Vancouver, but for thousands of young people around the world, the dream of making it to the Games still burns bright. Perhaps nowhere is the drive fiercer than in Cuba, where sport ruled supreme. An award-winning British documentary out this week follows three young Cuban hopefuls at Havana's Boxing Academy. The training is relentlessly tough, but with 32 gold medals for boxing in the past 40 years, 32, it is obviously a formula that pays off. The film's director, Andrew Lang, sat down with the BBC's Kirsty Lang to explain why Cuba invests so much in sport. After the, the triumph of the Cuban Revolution in, in 1959, within months, Fidel was making speeches about how important sport was. And uh, they set up these academies almost immediately. There were sort of several reasons. One was that if they spent money on sports, they'd save money in, uh, in health care. Another one was that the, the countries always felt under threat from invasion, and if the, the population was fit and healthy, they'd be more ready to fight off the Americans coming to invade. And, uh, and also it's a kind of uh, a, a nation-building tool and, and a way for the country to feel good about itself. For your film, you followed three 10-year-old boys who were hoping to become boxing champions, and it's a very, very tough regime, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredibly tough. I mean, these kids um, are getting up at 4 a.m. They're training for two hours in the dark. They then have a very meagre breakfast of an egg and a cup of milk. They're in school all day, um, struggling to stay awake, has to be said. And then they're back out on the, on the training ground from about 4.30 to about 6.30. Um, lights out is at 9. Um, and then a few hours sleep and get up and do it all over again the next day. And it's, it, it, it's a complete sort of lifetime commitment, isn't it? They're taken away from their families, it takes over their lives. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a case of making a, a decision very early on that that's what their life's going to be and, uh, and making this enormous sacrifice. And, and, and that was one of the things which interested me in making the film was, was this question of how, how much sacrifice is justified in, in pursuing your dreams, which, 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 which was a question those kids were having to answer, but also a question the whole sort of Cuban revolutionary experience has had to answer, because it's always this idea of sacrificing today for, to get something tomorrow, and, and at a certain point maybe you say, well, is it worth it? What are the families of these little boys hoping for? Well, the main thing they're hoping for is just is glory, is, is, is to be someone in, in a country where all the emphasis is on everyone being the same. And, and it's really about prestige and, and not about money, traditionally. Um, Cuba's most famous boxer, Teofilo Stevenson, was, was offered a million dollars to defect and said, well, what's a, a million dollars compared to the love of 10 million Cubans? So that's the traditional sentiment. But what's been happening recently is that the boxers have been starting to defect. What's striking about your film is how big a figure Fidel Castro is in the lives of these boys and in the lives of all Cubans. That there's not supposed to be a cult of personality in Cuba, but there very much is. I mean, the, the Cuban revolution is, is Fidel Castro, and, and everything those boys do is, is, uh, is about Castro, and, and they're regularly invoking him, and you know, they even have chants where they go, where, where Fidel's children. Well, unfortunately, um, being a successful Cuban sportsman nowadays doesn't bring any particular material advantage. Before the fall of the USSR, you, if you're a successful sportsman, you might expect to get a car, to get a nicer house. You'd be able to travel abroad, of course, which, which ordinary Cubans can't. You have to ask permission to leave the country in Cuba. Um, but nowadays, really, um, even if you become an Olympic medal winner, you, your, your lot doesn't improve very much. I spoke to the, the three boxers who defect in the film I, I met last summer in Miami and they'd all had to sell their Olympic gold medals um, you know, to feed their families and so on. So you can understand why, why some of them choose to leave.
I love the Castro impersonator. I wonder if he gives six-hour speeches as well.